speaking out for truth will be controversial. Uh, it'll get you into trouble. Um, John the Baptist, remember him. Uh, he spoke out against Herod. Herod had taken his brother's wife. And of course, um, it cost him his head, didn't it? He chopped it right off. I think of uh, the Apostle John as an older man exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he ran afoul of Rome, so much so that they sent him off to that rock pile uh, to waste away. But God had a plan, didn't he? And while he was there, God revealed to him the things that would take place in the future. And of course, we see the letters to the church or the warnings to the church, the great tribulation. And in chapter 21, you have the new Jerusalem. And then you have God's list of eight things he hates. Number one was the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile murderers, all sexual immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, all liars will be in the lake of fire. And I just want to look at the cowards for a second. Who are the cowards? I'm sure General Boykin would say, maybe back in Grenada when maybe the bullets were flying, if a young man dropped his rifle and <laughs> said, yo, I've had enough, and run the other direction, we would all probably agree that, that person is a coward. But I don't think that is what God is speaking about here. The definition of a coward, a coward will not confront an issue that needs to be confronted due to fear. That's a coward. A quote that has been quoted many times, and I'm sure most of you have used it in a sermon at some point or another, was from Martin Neumur, talking about the Nazis. First they came for the communist, and I didn't speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialist. I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist. I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak out. I was not a Jew. Then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak out for me. A coward. God hates cowards. And the cowards that the Lord is referring to are the men and women who know the truth but refuse to speak it, won't reveal it out of fear that someone is going to say something negative about them. Or maybe it's going to cost them their job. Or maybe their position of influence or whatever. I don't know. And I think about what are the, the things, the controversies today that make many run and compromise? Abortion's one. It's a big controversy. You don't hear a lot of churches anymore preaching against abortion. And the reason is because there's women in the churches that have had abortions and they don't want to take them off. They don't want to get those anonymous letters. Uh, there may be a little campaign to get rid of that pastor. And so it, it, it stirs up a, a hornet's nest. And it's not just the women, but it's fathers that have agreed to their daughter to have an abortion or 
I mean, the list goes on. And so let's just stay away from that subject. Let's try to let's, let's talk about things that unite us and bring us together so we, we can find reasons why to avoid preaching on it. But you have to preach on it because you've got to warn young women not to make that mistake. How do they know? We can't be cowards and, and run from something like that. It's the truth. Now, I had a woman, she, she worked for a, a famous liberal magazine in New York, and she was interviewing me. And we were in San Antonio, down along the river, in one of those Mexican restaurants, and there was a long table, about 10 of us, and the, we sat at the end. And so she was interviewing, asking me questions, and so after a few, well, it was a long time, it was about an hour, I said, can I ask you some questions? And she said, okay. And she put her pen down and she kind of folded her arms like, go ahead. I said, are your sins forgiven? All of a sudden, it's, I mean, her eyes filled up with tears. I said, are, is your soul secure in the hands of God? Do you know for sure that you have a right standing before him? And she said, no, I don't. And now the tears were coming down her cheeks. I said, would you like to be sure? Would you like to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God's Son, who died for your sins, who was buried for your sins, who God raised to life? Would you like to invite him into your heart and have him forgive you right now? She said, yes, I would. I said, well, let's bow our heads right here. And I took her hands in my hand. And now all the people at this long table were all now... Uh, <laughs> looking at what was going on. And so I led this woman in a prayer, just, Dear God, she said, Dear God, I'm a sinner. She said, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. She said, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sins. And now the tears were just coming down her cheeks. She repeated that after me, and we prayed the prayer, and... After the prayer, she looked at me. She says, I have to confess something to you. <laughs> I said, you don't have to confess nothing to me. I said, God has just heard your prayer and he's forgiven you. You're cleansed. You're forgiven. She said, no. And she got real intense. You know, what do you do? I, oh, okay. <laughs> um, she said, 20 years ago, I had an abortion. Well, God forgive me for what I did. I said, he just did. She said, it has haunted me all of my life. Every anniversary of that abortion, I thought about what that child would have been. Fifth grade, going to school, I mean, five years old, going to school. Sixteen, first prom. She said, it has haunted me. Well, God forgive me. I said, he's forgiven you. And she took her face and she buried her face in her hands and she wept out loud. But these were not tears of sorrow. These were tears of relief, tears of joy. Men, we have to warn young women of the consequences of this. Taking another life will haunt them all of their life. And we cannot be afraid to speak the truth to them, but at the same time to tell them that God will forgive them. He will forgive them and he'll cleanse them and he'll set them free. <laughs> Homosexuality is another great controversial issue. Now listen, moral issues we have every right to speak out on, every right. The, go the government and the politicians have taken now some moral issues and they've made them political issues and because they're political issues, they're saying you can't speak against them. We're all rubbish on you guys. You're not going to shut me up. We have, we have a responsibility to speak on the moral issues. Abortion, homosexuality, these are moral issues. 
Now, what someone wants to do, they, I mean, this is a free country. You can do what you want to do, but I want you to know it's a sin against God. This is a sin. Now, there's a lot of people. I've had, I've got some friends who are pastors, and they say, well, frankly, we listen. We don't want to become targets. We want to preach. We want to preach the word. We want to preach Jesus. We want to talk about His love and His forgiveness. But if we go that down that road, we're going to become targets. Well, don't you think the Lord Jesus Christ was a target? Right. Are we going to be cowards because we're afraid? Could we get our heads chopped off? We could, maybe one day. So what? Chop it off. But we don't, we don't want to be called a homophobic. And I tell people, listen, I'm not afraid of homosexuals. I'm really not. Matter of fact, I love them. I love them enough to care to warn them that if they want to continue living like this, it's the flames of hell for you. Now, if you don't like that, don't get mad at me. I didn't write the rule book. Almighty God wrote it. And it's a sin against him. And I tell you, listen, gentlemen. We live in a world where there is so much compromise. This city that we're in, that's all they do is compromise. We cannot go down that road. Because you and I are going to have to stand before God one day and give an account to Him. And you don't want Him to say from His lips, you were a coward. I'm telling you, it's fearful. When you read chapter 21, to think that God puts cowards at the top of His list. I'm telling you. It puts shivers up and down my spine. I don't want to be a coward. I want to warn people and I want to do it with love and sincerity. I want to give them hope, but I can't shut up. And men, I'm going to encourage you, don't shut up. But you want to know what the greatest controversy of all time is? It's when the Lord Jesus stood up and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Every person that thought they had good works and God would be impressed, Jesus slapped them in the face. When every religion that came down the road, that slaps them in the face. Because Jesus said it doesn't work. Your religion doesn't work. Your money doesn't work. The only way that you can come to the Father is through me. Because it's Jesus Christ who shed his blood on Calvary's cross. Okay? He shed his blood and the world hates that. He shed his blood and he was buried for our sins and God raised him to life. This is the gospel, okay? There is nothing else. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's Holy Spirit filled power in the gospel. And when we preach the gospel, God takes that and he pierces it into hearts and it works. We can't be cowards. Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was no coward. In Gethsemane, he prayed, Lord, if you can take this cup from me, but may your will be done. And here came Judas. And they had the torches and they had the swords. And the Lord Jesus stood up. He knew it was the Lord's will for him to go to the cross. And he stood before Ananias and Caiaphas, the high priest. And they brought all kinds of false testimony. His disciples fled. He's now alone and he's standing there with these wicked, evil men falsely accusing him. And he does it for you and for me. And then they beat him and they slap him. And they take him to Pilate and, now you talk about a coward, Pilate, that coward. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew it was out of envy. But they said, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate wanted to let him go, but they said, oh, he claims to be a king. Then you're no friend of Caesar. Oh, that put the shivers up and down Pilate's spine when he said that. And what did they do? He washes his hands. He gives in to the crowd, the coward. And Jesus takes the beatings, the scourgings, the humiliation. And they nail him to the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. 
See, I'm dying for the sins of the world. And these evil men don't even know what they're doing. And when Jesus died on the cross, the Roman centurion said, surely this must have been the Son of God. And you know what I thought about? Jesus was buried. Joseph Arimathea, they took him, put him in the grave. They rolled the stone. And then the Jews the next day went to Pilate and said, listen, this deceiver said he was going to come up out of the ground in three days. And we think his disciples will come and steal the body and then this deception will be worse than any of them. So Pilate says, okay, take some soldiers. Seal it as best you know how. And I love this. On the third day, all of a sudden, an angel comes out of heaven. Bam! There was an earthquake. I've often thought about it. Every time there's an earthquake, is that an angel coming? I don't know. <laughs> that stone is rolled away. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes up out of that grave and the Roman soldiers are witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're witnesses. And those Roman soldiers fall over as dead men. And then when they finally wake up, they run to the Jewish leadership and they tell them it's true. Jesus Christ is a risen from the grave. Jesus Christ is alive. He came up out of that tomb. You should have been there. You should have seen it, guys. Scared us to death. And those, those, those priests gave him some money. Shut up. Don't, don't say anything to anybody. You go back to Pilate and you tell him that the body was stolen and we'll protect you. Now the priests, the Jewish leadership, know the truth. Those cowards, instead of getting on their knees and begging God for forgiveness. They just cover it up. They're cowards. I don't want to be a coward. There's all kinds of controversies. And I tell you, every time you stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be controversial. And if you want to be loved by the world and be patted on the back, and go right ahead. Go right ahead. I don't care anything about it. I want to tell the truth, okay? And men, let's tell the truth. We don't have much time left. And guess what? There's a lot of young pastors out there that have been caught up into culture. Looking like the culture, smell like the culture, act like the culture, under the pretense of, well, we want to reach the culture. When did, God, when did the Lord Jesus Christ tell us to do that? We're to be salt and light. A city on a hill can't be hid. We're to be different. We're not to act like them. Let's act the way God wants us to act. Let's be holy. And let's be truthful. And let's be bold. Okay? And let's, let's warn the world. Let's warn our churches. Let's warn our communities. Let's warn the world. And you know what? Get in government like this man right here. Get, in go get on school boards. School boards, hear me? Get on the school boards. Get involved at every level of government locally. And you guys, when, when these school boards start voting this nonsense, you get up there and oppose them and then run them out of office and get some of your people in there to take their place. The greatest message in the world is the message that we carry. And that is what Charles sang about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? That God loves us that much that he would send his son to take Franklin Graham's sins and die and shed his blood on a cross for Franklin Graham that he was buried for Franklin Graham's sins. But yet God raised him to life. And if anyone puts their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will give us eternal life and we will be with him forever. That is the most wonderful, most beautiful, loving news that's ever been told. And guys, it's our responsibility to take it, right? And let's not be cowards. Let's be tough. 
tough as lions. Now, we need to pray for some people. We need to pray for that young lady over in Sudan who they want to cut her head off because she will not recant her Christian faith. She is no coward. That is a real sword that they want to chop her head off with. And then there's Pastor Saeed Abedini. He's over there in Tehran. I talked to his wife just this week. Nagme. He was in the bed, hospital, shackled. About 50 guards came and they started beating him. His mom and dad were in the room. Started beating him in front of his parents. Uh, using tasers, electric shocks. Then they, these cowards, they drug him out of the bed, kicking him, shocking him, and he finally collapses before they can get to the elevator and they've taken him back to prison. We need to pray for Saeed Abedini, that God will protect him and surround him with his angels and those fiery chariots. need a few of them too. And, and let's pray that God will bring him home soon to his family, to his wife. And let's pray that that woman will come out of jail and go back to her family. The woman that they're wanting to cut her head off. And the church around the world is under attack. Christians are under attack by Islam. And they keep using this word radical. It's not radical. It's just what it is. And... Let's, let's stand up for our brothers and sisters in faith around the world who are being persecuted for their faith. Because if we don't stand up for them, there's no other voice for them. There's no other voice. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Tony, thank you for this privilege. Uh, thank you for this honor that you've got. I don't deserve it. Um, it's just the way I was raised, that's all. Um, so I want to thank you and General Boykin. And uh, Dr. Towns, God bless you. You've been a great example to so many of us. Love you. Thank you. God bless you.